Welcome, aloha, and thank you for joining us at Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you for having us. And we have the honor and pleasure of having with us today three people with a lot of leadership experience in a diverse range of areas well beyond law into nursing and state government and other areas. And uh, Professor Emerita Renelia Randall from the University of Dayton School of Law, now in Florida. Uh, Professor Emerita Ben Davis from the University of Toledo School of Law, now visiting prof at Washington and Lee School of Law. <clears throat> and Doug Chen, good friend and former Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General of the State of Hawaii and chair of our Book and Music Festival. So Doug has branched out into areas that reach out to truly all the community, ages, backgrounds, tastes, and interests. So in thinking about leadership now, and this is probably a timely moment to be doing that given elections in play, in underway, elections coming, Hawaii's primary is next week, and other things going on. Not just what do we really need in leaders right now, but what do the leaders that we really need right now need to be able to do well to benefit our communities at all levels, local, state, national, and others. Doug, you've been a leader, Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General. What do you think our leaders really, really need to do well now? I guess I'll start as simply as possible and, and I'll, I'll, I'll remember the like one of my first mentors uh, was actually uh, Peter Carlisle. He was a prosecuting attorney for Honolulu for uh, for uh, several years. Um, and then he eventually became the mayor of Honolulu. And that's how I moved over into city government and served with him as the managing director. Um, it was so simple, but I, I remember then I was just in my my 30s and and I'd, I'd get caught up in, you know, what's the right thing to do in this case? And, and how do I strategize this? And what, what should I plan to do? And he would always just look at me and say, you got to do what's right. Um, and I know that's overly simplistic, um, but but I think it, it it makes a lot of sense because um, thinking about what's right and, and focusing on that kind of gets you away from all the calculations of, uh, you know what is expedient, or what is um, what is practical, or what will allow me to remain in power, or what will allow me to remain uh, well liked and well regarded by people, so that I can be able to get other things done. There, there's so many um, there's so many uh, motivations that go into decisions that are made, and uh, and a lot of them uh, just are are ones that need to be uh, sifted out. And so um, and so I I think about. Um, decisions. I'm on the police commission as well, so so that's uh, that's something we we made some big decisions yesterday, uh, and I was just thinking about how um, a lot of the commissioners were kind of focused on different motivations for why we should be what should be guiding our decisions, and ultimately where we coalesced around was well, I think we just got to do what's the right thing to do in this situation, and we we took action um, in that regard. That's a great place to start, Professor Randall. You've been involved in leadership in healthcare, in academics, in government over many years. What do you think leaders really need to be able to do best now? Well, I, I think it's a great question. And coming from my typically pessimistic point of view, uh, I have come to believe, I didn't always believe this, but I have come to believe that incremental change is problematic because systems can change to undo, incorporate, co-op, or otherwise do incremental change. And the problem becomes, I think, if we had incremental change that was always going to build upon itself, and the people who were going to come get in was going to always build upon it, I might not be so pessimistic, pessimistic 
But what I see from increment, what I have seen over my lifetime is, is that different people bring in different priorities, different ideas about what is right. And whatever incremental change you think you have made in a system, they're unwilling, they're willing to undo. So I think we need leaders prepared to say, we're ready to go bold. We're ready to ignore system norms, policies, procedures, processes, because that's what got us here today. We, you know, we need to go big or go home. Uh, it may end up going home, true enough, but incremental change is is problematic to me. That's a great insight. Ben, I can kind of hear the wheels turning in your head. I'm <laughs> sure you've got some thoughts on this. Um, I, I, I second both of your comments. Um, for, for, what it's, for what it's worth, uh, I'm a, a strong believer in uh, uh, individuals uh, experiencing a, what I call a contradiction between what they think is right and what is going on outside in society in terms of something, whatever it could be in any area. And I think that the difference in leadership is is the capacity for people to not just uh, sort of go along with, to get along with that contradiction, but to try to find some way in, to, to, to fight back against that contradiction between what they think is right and uh, what, the society is throwing at them. Now, in a big, we're all at different levels. It might best be somebody writing a letter to the editor of a newspaper. That is the thing that they are capable of doing. Obviously, some other people may be giving money or something like that. Some things it's running for office. Uh, sometimes it's choices of jobs. But uh, I'm a strong believer in uh, that being willing to recognize you're experiencing a contradiction between what you've been raised to understand is right and what society is throwing at you and to, to not just uh, um, let um, other priorities get in your way because um, for example, right now, one of the things that I think about is that I can't see how any self-respecting American, whatever their political persuasion, could vote for a candidate who has not broken with Donald Trump. I, I just, I don't care, you know, you, you can vote for other Republicans and all that stuff, but it, it, it just makes no sense to me that after all we've seen at this point, that, and so I look at people who are so-called leaders, and I see who breaks with, with the, the risks, and who didn't, you know, and it reveals something sufficient? about their cowardice. Is that sufficient? Breaking with Donald Trump is that sufficient? Is is getting Joe Biden in for another four years sufficient? Uh, I'm not saying anything is sufficient. Okay. I'm just saying that that basic kind of thing of breaking with Donald Trump, look how hard it is. Well, look at how hard we, it is. Yeah, but we won't even break with Biden. I, you know, if we're going to talk about breaking with the leadership of a party, which I don't disagree, let's talk about breaking with Biden. Well, I, I'm happy to, I'm happy to talk about breaking with Biden, but the point that I'm just trying to focus on is that, you know, there was the insurrection, you know, on January 6th. That was like enormous to me. And uh, and everything that I've watched with this January 6th committee, 
And I'm just like, how can people in good conscience, for whatever reason, opportunistically, vote for anybody who hasn't broken with that? Vote for anybody who still believes in the big lie. We just saw Arizona. Arizona's got a bunch of people who've been um, put in, in the primaries there who have not broken with the big lie. And I, you know, I, I look at those Arizonans and say, you know, what kind of crazy is that? Quite honestly, what kind of crazy is that? I mean, uh, you might want to vote for a Republican if you want to. That's fine. It's not my issue. It's that what kind of crazy still believes the big lie? All right. I mean, no, that's not that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting neither Republican or Democrat that they both are problematic. But when we when we tee up the golf ball to say who hasn't broken with Trump without teeing up the golf ball of who hasn't broken with Biden, then we set ourselves up to continue the ineffective leadership that we have in the Democratic administration, because all we're looking at is whether or not they broke with by Trump. Ah, okay. Well, okay. Well, then uh, I would start, I'll start with that one. Beyond that, the, the other thing that I, I just look at in leaders is, uh, I don't know if all of you are getting these, but I certainly have been getting a lot of requests for donations since the Dobbs decision. Enormous amounts of donations for, for the elections coming up this fall. And my thing was that, no, that's not good enough. You know, you got to do things now, and then we'll take a look later, okay? And I, so I've been looking at doing things now. And one of the things that I was really happy to see was, was yesterday, the day before, is the Kansas vote, where the people in Kansas said no, or hell no, to getting rid of women's rights. But I've also seen that there have been efforts to pass laws that will codify various types of rights of privacy at the federal level. And now they're in the Senate having to deal with those things. That's now, not after the election. I want that now and see how far people will go to the wall to try to change those laws to address it. That's what I call leadership now, not just give me money and, you know, in the pie in the sky in the fall after the elections, I promise I'll be the guy or the woman to do this thing. But it's like right now, what are you doing to make sure that? Basic human rights are being preserved. That's that's kind of what I look for because I sense a lot of people when I really going through particularly horrific times since that Dobbs decision. From what I when I read about it all, there's other decisions that are there, but I'm not saying there aren't other horrific. But I'm just saying that there's like serious trauma going on. And whether you're trying to address it right now or not is kind of part of what leadership is to me. I don't know. So let me ask a question here. Is, is we know whether it's public or private sector that really effective leadership has to assemble and unify and bring together and move forward with teams. The things that Doug, Professor Randall, and Ben are talking about uh, all can't be done by individuals. It requires different teams that span different areas. Uh, Doug, you've been in city and state leadership. Is collaborative leadership in these times even possible? Uh, well, I think it's possible at the city level. Uh, I think it gets, I guess, it gets much harder once you go into, um, I'll say, that. I think it gets harder once you go into the state level. Um, and then it gets extremely hard when you get to the federal level. And I, I think it's just because um, a lot more polarizing issues take place. So I think um, at a lower level, when you're not talking about um, morals or values or things like that, um, you're just talking about uh, how are we gonna get this street fixed or you know, how are we gonna build some infrastructure? Um, I, I think there's a lot less of that, um, a lot less of that polariz polarization um, that I think we see happen. Um, and so I think there's a lot more room for collaboration. Um, 
I mean, I've, I've actually been listening carefully to what everyone's been saying. And, and, and I, I find I, I learned a lot in the last 10 minutes because I, I think when I was first, uh, uh, it, it helped me to rethink about what I was talking about, because first of all, I, I talked about doing what's right. Um, and I think I, and now that I've listened to what everybody else was saying, I think I meant more in the sense of, you know, doing what's right, uh, and, and shifting aside, uh, the, the idea is that, well, this will not be a popular decision or this will, I won't be liked because of this decision. I think I've learned from mentors and from experience that, that it's better just to do what's right because ultimately that's what you got to live with at the end of the day. Um, but then I heard a big challenge. I, I, I liked what I, or I was, I was very interested in what I was hearing about how, uh, you know, sometimes uh, incremental change might not be something that we were all trying to go for. It might not actually create the, con the, the effect or the result um, that, that we're looking for. Um, because then what I think about is, is then I think about, well, practically speaking, when you get into those polarized areas, um, the only way the sausage can be made, the only way that anything can go forward is to have compromise. Because if you don't have compromise, um, then nothing happens at all. Um, and so I found that very interesting to, to hear about, well, maybe we shouldn't be trying for incremental change. And, and then I, and then I think we then went into a discussion about, um, you know, certain, uh, what I'd call like threshold issues, you know, sort of like, well, you know, if you, if you believe the big lie, you know, you, you need to reject the big lie or you need to, re you know, you need to, uh, you take a strong stand on abortion rights, or you need to take a strong stand on one issue. Um, I think that's where things get a lot more complicated. What was what was awesome about the abortion vote in Kansas is it was so simple, right? So it was just it's it's a very simple value that people were either for or against, and the voters spoke. Um, I think when it comes to uh, are we going to be uh, supporting are we going to be supporting Biden or are we going to be rejecting Trump, um, then it's it's so much more complicated right because it's not it's not just one it's not just one thing going on with biden or i mean it's not just one thing going on with president biden there, there's a lot of different things happening and and so um and so the decisions that people make might be based on well i don't like it because of this or i don't like it because of that but then how do you how do you deal with a president who has a hundred things that you could like or not like about them um and you could say well I'm going to vote for them, or I'm not going to vote for them, or I'm going to vote for a third candidate that there's no possibility that they would win, um, which essentially means my vote is is not, you know, it's it's it, you know, from a practical perspective, I've lived with my conscience, but I haven't necessarily um, had an effect on that, and maybe there's a long term effect because you know the ten thousand people who voted for a, a small candidate um, that that evolves into something over time, uh, so. I, I hope that made sense, but I, it, I I really appreciate what I'm hearing because I think it, it makes me think a lot about like, you know, leadership and also how do you get something done um, in, in a polarizing, uh, polarized society. Um, so and I appreciate I, the question, Chuck. This may be, it may be different for you in, uh, in Hawaii, but city politics, school board politics, city council politics in Dayton, Ohio was hugely problematic, uh, especially for those in the community that felt un unrepresented by the politics, which, which was either Democrat or Republican. And especially for the west side of Dayton, which was black. And so I would, having worked there for 30 years, I, I found that city politics, when there's a division within the population, uh, that it's not clean either, that it, that, and often, uh, I'll give you an example. We just wanted the school board to stop suspending kindergarten through third graders. To me, that just seemed the right thing to do. And everybody on our side thought it was the right thing to do. But the school board, for some reason, couldn't put their minds around doing that. And I don't want to go into the but. 
but the thing is, is, is that and there was a big division and what who was really affected by those suspensions were black kids uh black k kindergarten through third graders were being disproportionately suspended compared to white and hispanic kids so it, you would think so it, it it i think that that so i said it the, that city politics can also be as fraught with mine holes as uh, state, municipal, and thing. And I, my own feeling coming out of the, all of the work that I did did is we really needed someone to blow up the school board, mm -hmm. not physically blow it up, but just get on the school board and say, no, 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 this is not right what you're doing. No, we're not gonna have these closed meetings. No, we're going to vote for, we're, we're, you're going to have to publicly explain why you don't want, to, why you're willing to allow this to continue. We needed someone who was who was going to be an advocate for us on the city council for police, on the school board, for the city council for for funding for the the West Dayton, and for the school board. So, would that be effective? Probably not. Mm. Well, I'm not. But what has been happening? isn't effective either. So at least we could walk away feeling like uh, there was an advocate for us uh, in these places. And it wasn't just about, you know, what could get done, but, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's like the, um, you know, one, one thing that, that strikes me in what you're saying, um, Professor Randall, is the uh, the idea of what is the nature of civility, what is the nature of decorum in those spaces when you're talking about extremely desperate feeling things for those parents of those kids who are kindergartners to third graders being confronted by a kind of system that is basically not valuing their kids i mean it, this is huge pain you understand that i'm trying to speak to that and you're going up before a school board that seems tone deaf and the rules of decorum and civility are such that your the the impact of what you're trying to do gets kind of lost because you're you're supposed to be playing the second order game of sort of did you wear the right clothes or did you speak with the right accent or, you know, or this kind of thing. Um, and um, I see that there's a lot of that sort of formalism, if I could say it like that, mm -hmm. that is distracting from the substance of the actual complaints that people have. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we've seen most recently, just take the whole situation Uvalde, okay? that whole process that it's gone through for months now to find out what really went on and then as and all the efforts to distract to deflect to deny to hide you know and it's still going forward right um i just saw today uh something that makes me think of you know one of the things that is about leadership is being willing to be the lawyer to take the case to bring the lawsuit i mean if you look at this case about sandy hook and alex jones that's mm -hmm. where they had to get to to counter the fakeness being said the uh the other one is the brianna taylor case yeah. that just got put in so that's the other side of it too you know which is uh four police officers are being charged on the federal level but there's been a whole state and local process that absolved them. And sometimes it's the lawsuit that has to be the one. 
But then that's a very inefficient way of doing things too, is to have these lawsuits as a way uh, of, of countering, you know, these kinds of oppression. Especially the settlements. As we know, settlements don't change the law. And it, it really drives me crazy that a lot of the civil rights leadership is using settlements and that gets money to the family. And maybe there's something in the settlement that changes how the police operate or the school board operates, but that is not disclosed. It, it, in fact, one change, leadership change we could make is to say there will be no such things as private settlements uh, when they go to certain issues. If they involve, uh, in the, if they involve uh, the police, if they involve the school board, if they involve any level of government, uh, if they involve discrimination, uh, even in corporations, uh, settlements are private uh because the public has an interest in knowing and uh and that's an aside that's <laughs> sorry so how do we connect those dots between uh, the moral and ethical courage and boldness that you're talking about to do the right thing and truly prioritizing protection and support for the interests of those who have been most marginalized, most underserved, because that's the theme that we're hearing underneath this. These are the people who are still being left out, who are still being essentially victimized by the deficiencies in those leadership qualities to have the courage to do that. Are there people out there now who exhibit any of that kind of moral and ethical courage? Well, I think it comes to thinking about things, taking a perspective of short view or a long-term view. Um, and and maybe there's a bit of a balance of, you know, when you apply the short view and when you apply the long-term view. Um, uh, the, I, I, the example that I think about, um, I mean, it's, it doesn't necessarily go to um, advocating for disadvantaged populations, but I, I think about Liz Cheney and just you know the the leadership role that she took um, in the January sixth commission, or she was allowed to take by the by the people who were part of the January sixth commission. Um, I, I mean, we'll, we'll see whether or not um, she's voted out because she took that position. But clearly, um, she was looking at things from a long term point of view, you know, and and so um, and and was guided by that principle uh, in terms of how she was going to be. Uh, uh, running the commission, or how she was going to be uh, conducting herself on the commission, and the statements that she was going to be making. Um, I, you know, I think a lot of her colleagues um, have a short-term view, and so that's why they end up saying what they say. Um, and uh, and so anyway, that's that that's someone who jumps out as as somebody who you know would would have uh, would have that kind of principle in mind. Yeah. Huh? Are there others out there, Ben? Uh, um, well, I mean, I think that probably the most uh, influential non-political person for me is uh, Rev Reverend Barber and his efforts to build coalitions in different parts of the country as part of the Poor People's Campaign. Um, I think for the years that I've seen him working, and um, the, I think it's Reverend Theodorus, the two of them together, it has had a concentration on the most vulnerable parts of our society. And they've had some successes in some places, you know, but they didn't seem to ever lose sight of the ball, if I could say it like that. They seem to be very clear in what they're doing. They haven't been you know, bought off or something like that in some co-opted way. We talked about being co-opted before. Um, and, you know, that has been, uh, you know, just an, he's, he's really an example of, of leadership, at least in my view, um, that really is focused on the least of these. 
That's a great insight. So in our last couple of minutes, I want to ask each of you, what would you most want to see or hear from someone who was a candidate for a leadership position to make you think maybe this person offers at least some of the kind of hope we need? Professor Randall? Recognition of the flaws of the existing system. That's and how, and I see this at state, at local, state, and federal level, how the exist, that the existing one party system, capitalism, has with two branches, Democrats and Republicans, have contributed to a system where we're locked in because we force people to choose, make choices that they're unhappy with. And uh, just so that the other side doesn't get in. I want public recognition of that. I want people to say that and to say, while I may be running as a Republican or a Democrat or an independent or a Green Party, I are socialists. I recognize that we have a one party system and that as long as we continue to have this one party system, it's gonna be difficult to make change, but I'm gonna do the best I can under the system if you elect me. You don't hear people say that. Yeah, people don't talk about what's broken in order to be able to talk about how to fix it. <laughs> Doug, your thoughts, you've been in government leadership? Sure, I, I think ineffective leaders, they they govern through fear and through anger, uh, resentment, um, and through um, power and control. Uh, whereas I think effective leaders, they they have vision, um, they 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 have the ability to inspire people. Um, and, and I think yeah, as, as cynical as we want to get about everything, that's that's really, uh, I mean, those are the leaders who really stand out for me. So Ben, you want to finish us up for today? Yeah, yeah. I I would say that uh, uh, leaders who see the flaws, see the poor, see the middle class, and see doing things for them to make their lives better. Um, I I tend to think of when you look at these billionaires and all that. I remember that TV show Hoarders where you'd see this person with a house with all this incredible stuff. Well, I look at them as being hoarders of money. That and they is exactly need right. They, look, they need interventions because their relationship to money is very, very sick. And uh, when you think of the, the, the income um, that, you know, I think average salaries or something since 1970 have not increased for the average worker in the United States while there have been these productivity gains all through there that are essentially gone it's like no more of that's got to go back in the pockets of the poor and the middle class i'm, I'm not i'm not held up on 15 dollars an hour you know it might be 30 dollars an hour you know i don't know what the number is but that there's got to be more going into poor people's pockets and more health care for poor people and more good schools for poor people so it's not related to your property tax in what area and and more let's see in that bright eyes of those little kids you see all the time and having that brilliance be uh encouraged excuse me <laughs> brilliance be encouraged oh, as opposed to being uh, as opposed to being pushed down you know and i mean in every neighborhood this i see these kids you know and i'm just like god look at all that brightness that magic right and then you know you, has it been encouraged or has it been sort of the beating down of life been so bad you know that's so to me it's like leaders who do that all right you know don't worry about the rich folks the rich folks will always take care of themselves but make sure that the, you know food clothing shelter health care for the poor and uh jobs those kind of things bread and butter um and those are indeed the questions we Thank have you a horribly broken imbalance between privilege at one end of the spectrum and protections for those at the other end of the spectrum. It, it's 
It needs to change. We need to think and talk about what that's going to look like and what needs to happen to get there. Thank you all for your Thank insights, you. for your wonderful contributions. Come back and join us again in a couple of weeks. Think Tech Hawaii, Professor Randall, Thank Professor you. Davis, and Doug. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.